path for his followers is because he wants his followers to contrast what religion in his day was representing God like. Does that make sense? The world had a view of God that Jesus came to be viewed. Amen? And today, it's the same thing. The world has a view of God that he wants us to rebuke. He wants us to shine through that darkness and be what Jesus wants the world to know about God. So let's pray and jump right in. Father, thank you so much for your goodness, for your mercy, for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're in Matthew chapter 5, verse 7. For our beatitude, it says, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown, what friends? Mercy. So before we discuss what mercy is, let's discuss what mercy is not. Mercy does not mean that a person is easygoing or excuses everybody's sin. That is not necessarily mercy. Mercy is not an attribute that Christ, a natural attribute that Christ is talking about here, but he is addressing one of the fruits of the Spirit that can only be a result of Jesus' work in our hearts. Amen? Some people are naturally compassionate. Some people are naturally nicer than others. Yes or no? Have you met someone who's always positive, always giving? They're just naturally like, they may not even, they may not even be a believer. And you meet someone who's not so nice. He's not talking about just common courtesies or just the ability to be always uh, optimistic. He's talking about mercifulness that only comes from being connected with God. So mercy in the Greek means one who has uh, uh, pity, compassion for those who need help, but puts this compassion into action. There's a story of a young missionary couple, a doctor couple, uh, they went over to Ethiopia. And the wife of the young doctor was excited about going over there. By nature, she was very compassionate, very given, very generous. And that's all fine in America, but it can be dangerous in a third world. When people realize that you are compassionate and very merciful, in some countries, they are merciless. Does that make sense? So, what happened was, is that uh, they gather around, they try to, once people see that you are merciful, they tend to take advantage of that. Have you ever experienced that or heard of that happen before? Yeah. So when they're there, you know, they're working and she's naturally very compassionate. Before she knew it, she couldn't leave her home without going through a wave of people who needed help of some sort. When she would come home from the grocery store, the people would be going through her bags to see what they needed. And in six months, she was absolutely burnt out. She was exhausted. And she was on the verge of having a, a nervous breakdown and they shipped her back to America. And before she left, she said this. She says, when I left America, everybody thought what a wonderful missionary I would make. And now I'm going home six months later, a complete disgrace. And her mentor said, sister, I want to explain something to you. You thought God sent you there to help the locals. But God sent there to help you. He wanted to exhaust you so you would realize that it is not I but Christ that does the work. You see, it's only Christ and His grace and, in, and His mercy that is inexhaustible. Her natural compassion got to its limit of exhaustion. Sometimes it takes longer than six months. For, for Abraham, it took 25 years before the promised child was given. After he exhausted all his resources, God gave him the promise. So we cannot look at mercy in this context as a natural attribute. Some people are born with natural compassion, others are not. Christ is not talking to a bunch of unconverted people here on the Sermon on the Mount. He's talking to those who believe in Him, who are following Him. So we need to take that into consideration. So when the Bible says, 
Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. What does that actually mean? In other words, many people read that and they say, if you want God to have mercy on you, then you need to have mercy on others. But is that really what Jesus is saying here? So let's study this together. So first of all, mercy in Greek means one who has compassion, has pity for those who need help, and puts this compassion into what, friends? Action, okay? So it's more than just feeling sorry for something, but it's, it's doing something about it. So I want to go to a very famous story found in Luke chapter 10. So if you have your Bibles there, of the story of the Good Samaritan. You know, what happened there? There were two men that came by and saw this man who had been robbed, um, and they did what? They did nothing, they just went on, okay? They had compassion, but they did nothing about him. They were not merciful. Uh, and so Luke 10, we have this story. Question, who was injured, who was robbed? Was it a Jewish man or a Samaritan? It was a Jewish man, so I want to highlight that because the Jews had gotten so far away from God's work that not only were they not ministering to the Gentiles, but they were no longer even ministering to their own believers. Do you catch that? And so it's, it's a whole nother level of religious piousness. That now the judgment is not only about non-believers, but now the judgment is upon believers themselves. And then their story is that the Good Samaritan comes along and he helps the man, and you know the story. But I want to give some context here. Let's go to verse 25 of Luke chapter 10. So Jesus gives this parable because he's answering a question. And the question is uh, by an expert of the law. And it says in verse 25, on one occasion an expert of the law stood up to test Jesus. And Jesus, uh, he said, teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit what? Eternal life. So listen, listen. The, the very context of his question is salvation by works, yes or no? What must I do to inherit eternal life? The question is not focusing on anything but getting somewhere, not knowing God. Did he understand the gospel? No. So Jesus said, well, what's written in the law? If you want to be saved by something, then what does the law say you need to do? In verse 26, he says, uh, he replied, what, what is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? And then he answered, verse 27, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. So he had at least understood the Deuteronomy reference, that the essence of the law is love. The essence of the law. That, that's what Jesus said to him. Verse 28, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he still wasn't too sure about his salvation. So then he asked in verse 29 to justify himself. Who is my what? And then Jesus goes into the story of the Good Samaritan. The story then. So who is my neighbor? Jesus replies, we'll just quickly go to the story. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. When he fell into the hands of robbers, they stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him pass by on the other side, but a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when, the, when, the, when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine, and when he had put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said. When I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Let me pause there for a second. A few camp meetings ago, um, Henry Wright preached an amazing sermon on the innkeeper. You can go online and hear that sermon. It's powerful. It's one of the sermons that sticks to my mind. The innkeeper. All right, let's go on. Verse 36, now Jesus, after he gives his story, he asks a very simple question. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robber? The expert of the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do what? Likewise. Now notice this. 
Jesus did not ask which one had done the right thing to inherit eternal life. Why? Because that is never what God focuses on. God always focuses on people. But in our sinfulness, we tend to focus on where we want to go and not on who we need to step on to get there. And Jesus didn't ask him, did this guy do what he needed to do? He asked him, who was the proper neighbor? And he responded correctly. Keep this in mind, this man was raised up as a Jew with a different idea completely. Jesus said in Matthew 5, you have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. In other words, Jesus is identifying a very clear Jewish understanding. Love your neighbor, but hate your enemy. Because that's, that's how the Jews interpreted it. The Jews interpreted that their neighbor were fellow believers. And anyone who was not a believer was not a, a neighbor, but they were an enemy and they should be hated. That's still very much a common practice today. But then Jesus said in verse 44 and 45 of Matthew 5, I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. And this was a huge paradigm shift for people of his day because the Jews had this understanding that there's no possible way that the God of heaven could bless a heathen. There's no possible way that a blessing from God could come to someone who doesn't believe in God. And Jesus says, no, listen man, the, the rain comes on the righteous and the what? The unrighteous. Have you ever wondered why some, like, so, like have you ever wondered why someone who has addiction issues, who never goes to church, who doesn't worry anything about their health, is living healthy, perfect lives, and yet someone who is going to church, even a vegan life, has just been told they have cancer. And people say, what is going on? Why does that happen? Now Jesus is changing them. Remember, Jesus is trying to get them to think differently. And he's trying to help them understand that this gospel isn't about getting somewhere, but it's about getting to know someone, and that is Jesus. So to Jesus, even your enemies, the non-believers, these atheists, these crazy liberals, are also our neighbors, what do you say? Now you say the same thing to the lawyer in Luke chapter 10, but in a parable. And the lawyer didn't really understand, he says, how does he really know what he's talking about. How can I love everybody? And Jesus is trying to show him that he can't be saved by his works. The Good Samaritan didn't see the man and he didn't say, oh, I can't just pass this guy. I need to make sure I help him in order to go to heaven. He just helped him because he was what? A compassionate human being. He's a Samaritan. And I love the fact that how Jesus, like in many other cases, uses a non-believer as the ideal example of a believer as he's teaching believers who are falsely represented that they believe in God. Does that make sense? So I say that three times fast. He uses those who are not being accepted in the religious bubble as righteous to show the righteousness of God. Why? Because Jesus is trying to change religious norms. We are very easily trapped into our own bubbles and Jesus is trying to change that perspective. Mercy is having compassion and pity but putting it into practice. There's a difference in the Bible between mercy and grace. Grace offers pardon and justification from sin. While mercy offers relief, healing, and help because of sin. Amen? So God does both. God saves us by His grace, which means He pardons and justifies us. 
but he also gives us mercy. He comes to our aid. He offers us healing because of our sin. Amen? Now, I, I praise God for that. I love knowing that God justifies me completely by his grace. But I love to know that Jesus just doesn't leave me there. By his mercy, he continues to work on my heart and on my mind. Amen? For example, let's go to Titus chapter 3. In Titus chapter 3, um, Paul is describing the condition of what we used to be like and why we are the way we are now after knowing Jesus. In Titus chapter 3, we'll start reading here in verse 1. It's important to understand this context and what Jesus is laying out here. When you're there in verse 1 of chapter 3, let me hear it. Amen. Amen. The Bible says, remind the people to be subject to the rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and to show true humility toward all men. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. Then he says in verse 4, but when the kindness of and love of God, our Savior, appeared, He saved us. Not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy, He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. Amen? See, we're not saved by our works and our righteousness or the mercy we have given, but we are saved by the mercy that God has given. It's only after he saves us that now he says, go and be merciful. Micah, the Old Testament prophet, was talking, he, he, he referenced God and he said, he has showed you, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. So Jesus is the same thing He's saying the same thing in Matthew. I want you to do what I have done for you. I want you to express the mercy you have received from me. And I love how in Luke, in Luke, he goes through the Beatitudes as well, but he says things a little bit differently. And this one in Luke 6, verse 36, he says, Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. So, same thing, but said differently, yes or no? In Matthew, he says, have mercy, so you will be shown mercy. But in Luke, he says, be merciful just as your Father is merciful. In other words, mercy, from a Christian perspective, is not a result of someone's natural ability to be compassionate, but it is a result of someone receiving the mercies of God. Does that make sense? Let's go to James chapter 2. Now, James... Uh, James is addressing this balance between faith and works, and we know this well. And he says something very interesting in verse 12. And we basically outlined, let me ask you this, are we saved by faith and works? No. But what James is highlighting in chapter 2 is not that we're saved by faith and works, but we are saved by a faith that works. Does that make sense? Huge difference. You know, faith has a natural reaction that works. It's not faith and works, but a faith that is always working. So, he says in verse 12, Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Freedom from what? Freedom from sin. What else? No, he said, speak and act. In other words, I want you to speak and live. As someone who will be judged by the law that gives us freedom. Again, the New Testament, Jesus' Jesus' new perspective is not so much about theological understanding, but he wanted people to live differently. How did they live before the understanding of salvation that comes from Jesus? By works. Go to Galatians chapter 5. We can keep your finger there in James. We'll jump back there in Galatians 5. The Galatians... <coughs> We're trapped in legalism. And so Paul says to the Galatians in chapter 5, verse 1, 
He says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. They were fighting over what should be constituted as actions for salvation. They couldn't grasp the idea that salvation is a gift by grace had we been saved. So he goes on to say in verse 13 and 14, You, my brothers, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. And then he says in verse 14, The entire law is summed up in a single command. What is that? Love your neighbor as yourself. Interesting. The entire law is summed up in one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. You see, my friends, this is kind of hard. Let's go back to James now, because this is not something that naturally is produced in our hearts. James goes on to say in James 2, verse 12 and 13, <coughs> speak, and act and uh, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives us freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs, what friends? Judgment. Look at, look at it. Mercy triumphs judgment. In other words, the early church was so focused on judging people that there was no room for mercy. The law was so important that there was no room for mercy. And what Paul is saying, what Jesus is saying, listen, there are times that you need to put the law aside in the case of mercy. That's important to understand. Mercy may require for religious norms to be pushed in aside in order to help other people. For example, I think of my friend Bart Montilli in Brooklyn, New York. He lived right on Ocean Parkway. Ocean Parkway was a high demand commodity for the Jewish community. On Ocean Parkway, it stretched, I don't know, 10 miles all the way down to Coney Island. And all along that strip, you have huge synagogues on both sides of the parkway. And this was, this was very important for the Jews because they don't walk more than two miles on the Sabbath. So they would pay millions of dollars to live within walking distance of their synagogue. And, and Bart was an Italian guy. He'd been there his whole life. He, he raised his children in that house. And the, the rabbis would come to his house and they would knock on his door. Hey, we'll give you $3 million right now for you to move out in 30 days. He's like, no, this is my house. I'm not going anywhere. My money is just as green as yours. And he was telling me, tell me one day, he was sitting on his balcony on the Sabbath, and across the parkway was a huge synagogue. And there was a man jogging, and he happened to fall in front of the synagogue, and he cut himself really bad in his arm, and he's bleeding profusely. And Bart is looking at this, and this guy falls just as synagogue went out, and hundreds of Orthodox, faithful God followers are coming out of the church, and they see a man bleeding to death in front of the church, and what do you think they do? Nothing. Because to help that man who was bleeding and dying in front of my church would be to work on the Sabbath, and I can't do that. So Bart had to leave and go help this guy before he bled in front of all these believers in God. Sometimes you got to put religion aside and focus on people. What do you say? Amen. See, Paul says we're going to be judged by this gospel that has set us free. Not only free to go to heaven, but free to live as God wants us to live. If we throw out the mercy God expects us to have, we're throwing out the whole gospel. Notice what he says in verse 14. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? He's talking about two kinds of faith. Cheap faith and genuine faith. He goes on to say, suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food, and one of you say to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical need. What good is it for you? In the same way, faith by itself, 
if it's not accompanied by action, is what? Dead. See, James is not saying that faith and work saves us. What he's saying is that genuine faith is always accompanied by works. And he goes on to give Abraham as an example how Abraham had faith. And how did Abraham show his faith? By his works, which was to sacrifice his son Isaac, yes or no? That was true faith. Faith that comes accompanied by works. Now let's go to the second half of the Beatitude because this is also a very important thing to understand. It says, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Now many people misunderstand this last part. Similar to the Lord's Prayer where it says, Father, forgive us our debts, for we also have forgiven our debtors. But many people don't want to pray that prayer because they know they haven't forgiven anybody. And they have this mentality. God's going to give me mercy because I'm merciful. Or God's going to forgive me because I forgave others. What's the key problem with that issue? It's this for that. For those of you who are in, involved with politics, it's a quid pro quo. It's a this for that. Wrong. There's nothing, friends, that we do for our salvation. It's only by the grace of Jesus. Amen? When people have that, that, that idea that mercy and forgiveness comes from their own mercy and forgiveness, it's wrong. It's like when you, people, you hear people say things like, man, I don't like you, but because I'm a Christian, I have to forgive you. What are they really saying? It's better to say, I can't stand you. Pray that God transforms me, amen? But we're so conditioned to say, well, I'm a Christian, so i got to forgive you. No. You don't have to do anything. You are free to choose to love God or not to love God. It is worse to say you forgive someone and really don't forgive them than just to say, I really can't stand you. I wish all of God's curses upon you. Amen? Because at least you can acknowledge, God, I need, I need you to transform my heart because I cannot find it in me to have victory over this bitterness or this pain. Amen? And when we do that, God does amazing things. I want to share with you some quotes from Ellen White. She says in the steps of Christ, she says, There are those who profess to serve God while they rely upon their own efforts to obey the law, to form a right character, and secure their salvation. Their hearts are not moved by any deep sense of the love of Christ, but they seek to perform the duties of the Christian life as that which God requires of them in order to gain heaven. What are those things? What are those, what are those performed duties that we tend to know of really well? What are some of those? Can you tell me some of that? Keep the Sabbath. Pay your time. Treat people nice. Get involved with community service. Whatever the case, we think that because we're a Christian, we need to do this, or else it doesn't show that we're a Christian. The only thing that shows you're a Christian is your faith in Jesus. Everything else is the result of that faith. Amen? She goes on to say in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 523, Love to God is the very foundation of religion. To engage in His service merely from hope of reward or fear of punishment would avail nothing. Now how many people come to church because they're afraid of going to hell? A lot of people, yes or no? How many people go to church just because they want to get to heaven? That was the Jewish mentality. Remember the, the, the expert of the law. What must I do to inherit eternal life? That is the mentality of Jesus' day. And friends, guess what? It's the mentality of 2019. And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Amen? That is pagan perspective of salvation by works. So don't be a pagan follower of Christ. What do you say? Amen? Let's go back to Matthew 5, 7. We must be clear that mercy towards sinners makes us merciful because we have received mercy from God. Now, the best example is found in Matthew 18. Let's go there together. And one of the story. Now, Peter was a very practical kind of guy. 
And he came to Jesus one day and he says, Man, Jesus, how many times do I got to forgive my knucklehead brother? And Jesus said to him, and no, Peter said, seven times. Because they had, the Jews had this understanding. They, they went over, the pious would go over and beyond the whole three, three strikes in your mouth. They say seven. But on strike number eight, it was off with your head. So Peter says, seven. And what did Jesus say? Seven times 70, which is 490. Can you imagine? You lose count. The, the emphasis was, you keep on forgiving them. Amen? And then he goes on, he gives this parable. Uh, verse, let's start with Matthew 18, verse 21. Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times. And Jesus says, I tell you, not seven times, but 70 times seven, indefinitely. Therefore, he goes on to say, the kingdom is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. Now, Jesus begins his parable. And the man says, the king discovered a man who owed him talents. And as he began the settlement, he owed him 10,000 talents, which was brought to him. And since he was not able to pay, the man ordered that he, his wife, and his children, and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. So just take into context here. We know the story, right? This man was forgiven 10,000 talents which translated to modern-day money would be $10 million. I don't know about you, but if I owe anyone $10 million, I'm in trouble. If I, know, if I owe anyone 100 bucks, I'm in trouble. And this man finds the reality. He's like, my wife and my kids and my life are not going to be slaves forever to pay this back. And he begs the man, he begs the king for mercy. Notice what he says. He says, the servant fell to his knees. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him. And what, friends? And what? Say it loud. For a game, my Bible says, canceled his debt. Now, the man paid. He, he, he requested more time to pay back the money. But the king went over and beyond. He said, you know what? Don't pay me back. Forget about it. That's pretty good. Yes or no? Man, that would be a relief off my shoulders. And then we know the story. The guy goes out and he finds a man who owes him a hundred denarii. You know what a hundred denarii translates to? One dollar. And what does he do? He doesn't forgive him. He takes him by the throat and demands that he is paid back the dollar. And when the king's servants heard this, they went back and told the king. The guy brings him back in verse 30. He says that he refused. He said he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed. He went and told their master everything that had happened. And then the master called the servant in, you wicked servant, and said, I cancel all the debt of yours because you begged me. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? Notice the question here. The question was meant to be one of self-reflection. Self what? Reflection. I forgave you of $10 million. I didn't give you more time to pay me back. I didn't ask, I didn't give you, I didn't give you another time frame. He canceled it completely. It reminds me of Y2K. You guys remember the Y2K scare? Yeah. When the class was going to go 2000, everyone was afraid that all the debts were going to be canceled. I remember Pastor, you guys know me, Jamil, Jay's brother. Jamil was like, hey man, let's go buy some brand new Tahoe's. Let's finance them things. Because when the year hits, the debt will disappear. Boy, it didn't work that way. Praise God, we couldn't qualify anyways, but we didn't do that. But that was a mentality. What a beautiful thing it would be that some of our debts would be just completely canceled. And this guy owes him a dollar. And you could get lucky and find a dollar on the street. He wasn't asking for his, can his debt to be his dollar to be canceled. He just needed more time. And the guy said no. And the guy says, shouldn't you have had mercy? You see, my friends, we as sinful people tend to question why the beggar is begging. <laughs> right. 
Someone says, hey, can I get a dollar? Well, maybe you should have made some better financial decisions. Well, I'm hungry. Well, maybe you shouldn't have wasted all your money on alcohol. Well, I, you know, I'm, I'm homeless. Well, maybe you should have made better choices in your life. The, the sinful nature of our characters will look upon people and question why they're begging. But a Christian reflects on how God has forgiven and shown him mercy and therefore Amen. can give mercy to others. Amen. In other words, a Christian, when they, when they see someone who is in need, they don't, they don't say, man, they deserve to be there. A Christian sees someone in need and says, man, I remember how God gave me mercy and grace. How can I help you? Huge shift, yes or no? Yeah. And that's the result of true spiritual mercy. It's not a result of good old compassion, good morals, and good conduct. It's a result of reflecting on what God has done for you, and therefore you are overwhelmed by His mercy and are able to give mercy unto others. Amen? You see, the gospel is not cheap grace, friends. The gospel is a conforming power. The gospel just doesn't make you feel happy inside and leave you the same way. The gospel rejoices in you and transforms you. What do you say? Look how, look how Romans puts it. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. First the Jew, and then for the Gentile. Amen? Corinthians, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is what, friends? The power of God. You see, friends, when I look at what Jesus has done for me, I can't help but say, thank you, God. Amen? It doesn't matter if it's a Jew or a Gentile, if they're in need, they're a child of God. Amen? Jesus is teaching his new believers, his, his new movement to change perspective from look away from the religious norms and focus on people. What do people need is more important than what people know. Amen? Corinthians says, I glory in the cross of Christ because it is power not only to justify us, but to change us. We may fall, we may make mistakes, but our goal is to be like Jesus, to have the heart of Jesus, to let people see the God of heaven. What was lost in Eden, friends, what was lost in the great controversy in heaven was not a location of heaven but it was a relationship with God. When Adam and Eve sinned, what's the first thing that God said to Adam? Why are you? Where are you? Who told you? You were naked. When Adam ate that fruit, he didn't magically appear outside of the garden. What changed because of sin was the relationship between man and God. <coughs> And what Jesus came to rectify, what the Bible says, to reconcile, was the relationship between man and God. That's why Jesus could say things, heaven, the kingdom of heaven is among you. The glory of the gospel isn't just getting to heaven. The glory of the gospel is that one day we're going to sit at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Amen? Amen. That is the beauty of every human relationship. Why don't we have potluck? Not because we're always hungry at 1, one o'clock, but because we love to fellowship with people. Yes or no? Mm -hmm. There's something powerful about breaking bread together. You break bread, you make friendships, you make relationships. That's what it's all about. My, my favorite holiday is coming up just around the corner. We got beans, greens, potatoes, great, you know that. <laughs> Praise the Lord! Amen. Thanksgiving! Watch 
is about breaking bread with our brothers and sisters in Christ. What do you say? Amen. There's a story that, that went viral this holiday, this holiday, this holiday, this Halloween season. You guys heard about it? This boy is trick-or-treating. He goes up to a house and he sees that, the, that the, the bucket of candy is empty. And what he did trans went viral. He took candy out of his own bag and put it in the bowl so kids that come later would have candy. I thought it was pretty amazing, yes or no? Yes. And then the, the owners of the home who caught this story reflected on this boy and they said this, and I quote, this has to give hope to everyone that there is still amazing people in this world. What do you say? Amen. Now, I don't know about you, friends, but I think it's ironic that a young boy dressed as Dracula on Halloween can shine for Jesus. Someone say amen. amen. What is beautiful about this is this. Let me ask you this. How do you think the world looks as Christ, at Christianity as merciful? Yes or no? Instantly. Every time I ask that question, it's like, no. You know, it's true. When people start to flounder in their faith, when they know they're living not in harmony with God's will, they tend to stay away from church. You know why? Because some of us would be like, mm -hmm. I saw you the other day. They like to see you. Oh, let's just be real. Some folks don't even like to be asked, how was your week? Because they don't want to be judged. Sometimes we're like, you know what? I've had a hard week. I've been on my face all week long. The reality is the perspective of modern day religion is no different than Jesus' perspective in his day. Let me ask you this now. In Jesus' day, was it just as sinful as it is in our day? Sure, there was adultery, there was corruption, there was theft, there was lying, there was all that stuff that we have today. But let me ask you this question. Was Jesus looked upon as merciful by the people of his day? Yes. yes. And so is it possible that the world can look upon us as merciful in our day? Yes. Yes. And that's what Jesus is preaching on the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed, which means what? Happy. Happy are those who are merciful. Why are they happy? Because they reflect on what God has done for them and therefore can give mercy to others. Amen. You see, my friends, God is calling us to change. And if this little boy, this, these folks can acknowledge hope in this situation. Can you imagine when, when the community of San Jose experiences mercy from every one of us? When they see it, when they feel it, that is the gospel. That's true, that is what Jesus is wanting to change. He wants us to get out of our religious norms and touch the lives of people. Amen. So my friends, this morning I have a simple question for you. And that is this. Are you willing to take that challenge? Yeah. And say, Jesus, I want my life to reflect the mercy and grace and love that you have given me. Yeah. It will change people's lives, friends. Yeah. It will transform them when they get to know the power of Jesus. I know that's my heart's desire, friends. I look at Jesus and every time I get mad at folks, and I get mad at folks all the time. I'll be real with you, I'm mad. I have to stop and ask myself, hold up. Man, I, I'm a chief of sinners. But my Jesus loves me. And when we allow God's Spirit to transform us in this way. Friends, like Paul says, there's no Jew or Gentile. There's no free or there's no bond or free. We are all children of God. Amen. Amen. And by God's grace, we will see soon 
on those streets of gold. The relationships that were built because we led people to Jesus. And those people found an everlasting life in Christ. Woo! Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much. Because you have given us a new perspective, a new challenge, a call to change how we represent you on this earth. I pray, Father, that you would help us to shine for you, to not lose sight of what you have called us to do, and that our lives would reflect that mercy that we have received from your hand to give unto us. Thank you, Father. We ask your blessings in Jesus' holy name. Amen.